Thank you, Stephen. Uh, just want to say thanks for everybody coming. I know there's a release the monkeys going on in the other room, and I was actually a little bit disappointed I couldn't get to access. Sound pretty awesome. But yeah, so appreciate the good turnout, guys. As Stephen says, I'm Zeki. I'm a developer at Deloitte Digital. Um, went to UU and did computer science, and here I am now. So as Stephen said, I'm doing an introduction to open banking. So hopefully, what I'll be able to run you through is what open banking actually is. Where has all of this kind of noise come from about it? How is the UK actually going about implementing open banking? Why is it beneficial to you and me and to the economy and to everyone involved? And what kind of ecosystem does open, open banking actually promote? And then hopefully at the end, I'll be able to give you a wee bit of a demo of some code I've written which communicates with one of these open banking APIs and provides some value to a user. So moving on. So before discussing what open banking is, let's talk a little bit about what banking looks like right now. So I'm sure I can say I'm not the only person in the room who has a section on their iPhone or their Android phone who looks like that, who has multiple different finance apps. So I've got my Amex, Halifax, Ulster Bank, Barclay Card, too many other credit cards and accounts which I'd like to name. I've even got a business account there from when I've done some freelance work in the past, which fell flat on its face, which I need to delete that, but I just like to reminisce sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm sure I'm not the only one who has an app who has something which looks like that. And there is a very, well, there's a reason. There's not a good reason for why it looks like that, but there is a reason. And that reason is because banks have historically maintained control over our data. So that data can be financial transactions, our accounts, our loans that we have, our mortgages, everything that we have, banks own that and they dictate to us how we actually go about getting access to that data. And the way they've done that in the past has been through branches, but then banks thought, oh well, here's the internet, so let's start creating websites and apps. And so we have the app store littered with all of these different apps. So each bank developed its own API and its own proprietary app, which communicates with that API for us to, to get that data problem with that proprietary API and to try closed API sorry and proprietary app is that that is the only way for us to communicate with the bank via the internet so we couldn't come along and communicate with this API ourselves it has to be done through an authorized way that the bank has given us ie these apps so then moving on to what actually is open banking well if you flip that on its head that's what you get so open banking is a secure way to give third party providers access to your information. So rather than being a first party provider, i.e. the bank, we introduce a third party provider, i.e. anyone else, could be anyone in this room. So data is shared with these third party providers through the use of open APIs, open being different from closed in that anyone can use it. There are no barriers to entry, you do not have to pay to use it, and anyone can come along and communicate with it. So, rather, so what you end up with is rather than having to use a bank's app to communicate with this API, what you can end up with is a third party's app communicating with that API. So you see the diagram there. Um, you can see what closed banking looks like, i.e. what we've kind of had up until now, where we've got our proprietary apps communicating with this closed API, and then that's the way we get our data. Where if you flip it on your head, you get what's on the right, where you've got all these third party apps communicating with a public or open API. So for open banking to succeed, it wouldn't really solve the problem for every bank to come along and just say, okay, well, I'm going to open up my API. Because what you'll end up with then is just Danske Bank, Santander, Ulster Bank, every single bank creating an open API, which has a completely different set of standards, which becomes a nightmare for a developer to come along and actually communicate with every single one. It becomes very difficult to, to manage, especially in such a volatile environment where things are changing all the time. So ideally, every bank will abide to the same set of standards, i.e., if you want to retrieve an account, you would use the path forward slash account forward slash the ID of the account you're trying to retrieve. So where has all of this open banking stuff come from? Why is it now such a big deal? Why are you potentially hearing about it on the media if you watch the news? So it's all stemmed from a piece of legislation passed by the European government um, known as PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2. So we're all familiar with laws, but we might not be familiar with what a directive actually is. So a directive is something which says what you must do, but it doesn't tell you how you do it. 
So this directive was brought up by the EU. It said, okay, every single EU country, here's what you need to do. You need to start implementing open banking. That's what you have to do. We're not going to tell you how to do it. We're going to leave that up to you. And you can figure out the details and you can figure out what you think is best to work. So every EU company, or every EU country rather, sorry, has been left up to their own devices, including the UK, to come up with what they think works for open banking. There are a few little details that the EU wants every country to implement for open banking. So it mandates for the creation of this new third party provider known as an account information service provider. So summed up, this is a third party, someone who doesn't belong to the bank, who comes along and collates all of your different information together for you and can present that back to you and maybe provide some value on that information. So anyone in this room, if I thought, hmm, actually, I like the sound of what they're doing, I, like, I think they have some value to offer me with their app, I could then say, yes, please get my information for me from the bank. And the bank has to do that. It's, it's the law. So yeah, banks are obligated to share your data if you, if you permit it. So third party providers are forbidden from using the data for any other reason. So I'll discuss it a little bit later, but one of the ways which this is being implemented is through the use of OAuth, where you give different permissions for what you allow to be done, what you don't allow to be done. And if these third party providers are violating that, then there'll be repercussions. So how is the UK actually going about implementing it? So a few years ago, there was the Open Banking Working Group set up at the request of HM Treasury to try and come up with what open banking is going to look like in this country. What do we need to do to make this a success? And how do we make sure it actually lasts? So it recommended the use of an open API by all the banks. And the APIs, or the banks were recommended rather, to design the APIs to a certain standard. So what I discussed earlier where every single URI path will be the same across banks. So if I wanted to get my account from Santander, I would do forward slash account, forward slash account ID. If I wanted to get it from Ulster Bank, it would be the same forward slash account, forward slash account ID. And what that means is that it just decreases the barriers which exist for developers and for entrepreneurs to come along and create something which can provide some value to a user. So Danske Bank, Ulster Bank, Santander, all your kind of mainstream banks, they're all in the process of making their APIs open and available. Um, PSD2, it's everything to do with that. It's called getting transposed into our law, but it became law for us in January of 2018. It'll be one of the last pieces of legislation that we actually take forward from the EU. And what, whenever it got transposed into our law, what that meant is that banks were now obliged, they'd be breaking the law if they were not now putting in place measures to start doing what this open banking working group was recommending. So what I touched upon earlier was OAuth to protect the user's data. So another recommendation which the open banking working group gave was that they recommended to use OAuth to manage all of this data. So, some people in the room may be thinking, well, actually, I do have someone who aggregates all of my data at the moment. Um, I log into an app. I type in my banking username. I type in my banking password for my different accounts. And yeah, I do have a service which provides me with that. But there's a bit of a problem there and a bit of a flaw in that you're handing over your username and your password to a third party aggregator who then goes and who physically uses your username and password to log on behind the scenes and performs what's called screen scraping. So what it does is it looks for certain HTML to pick up different information and gets all of that back. It's not ideal because screen scraping just involves a lot of effort and a lot of work. And if the bank's um, web interfaces are changing all of the time, then it means that the developers constantly have to update from that. And it also means that now we're trusting our username and our password with this third party with not a lot of regulation and with not a lot of, I, not a lot of transparency, really, for what how they're storing it, what they're doing with it. So technically, we're just handing over all of our data. Whereas what OAuth does is similar to how OAuth works with Facebook and Google. Whenever you try and use your Facebook or your Gmail to log into a third party app, what it does is it pre presents you with a list of things which this third party app wants. So for example, it could want your email address, 
Cambridge Analytica might want access to all of your friends and all of your information possible. And if you click yes, then technically you are handing over all of that data. But it's up to you. It's not, it's not an opt-out thing, it's an opt-in thing. So to begin with, it doesn't have any permission. And then you selectively give it more, depending on what you want to do. So all of these UK banks and all of the EU countries are implementing this. It doesn't mean that you have to use open banking if you don't want to. But if you do want to, then that system's there to protect you. So why is it actually beneficial to people? And this is the part which actually does kind of matter. Yes, it's pretty cool to have all of these open APIs. And yes, it's cool to be able to create a musical song from all of your financial transactions. But what does it actually do for the people on the ground? What does it do for the people who struggle day to day? Like, I mean, as you saw, like, I have nine or 10 different apps, which I do check pretty regularly on a, on a monthly basis to see what's going on, what money's coming in, what money's coming out. And so how does this actually benefit me? Well, according to the government run money advice service. So this was a service which was really set up at the height of the recession when people were losing their homes and going bankrupt. This was set up to, to provide advice to help people. And so what they identified was the four out of 10 adults in the UK are not in control of their finances. Like that means four out of 10 of us really statistically aren't actually in control of their money. I do feel sometimes I fall into that category. 19 million of us don't have an approach to budgeting that we feel work. And four in 10 of us have less than 500 pounds in savings, which is quite worrying. Um, it's pretty scary. And people are spending too much and saving too little without understanding the consequences that it's going to have on them. Like, I put in a ridiculously low amount of money into my pension each month. And I'm sure in 50 years' time, I'm going to look back and be like, why didn't I just put more money in that? But we just don't have that transparency of understanding how our decisions now are affecting us in the future. Hopefully, and what I think and what many other people think, is that if banks relinquish their control of our financial data, it will enable us to make better and more informed decisions about our spending and our savings. And hopefully, these third party providers will also help us make these decisions. So for example, if someone's easily able to identify that their coffee habit is costing them hundreds of pounds a year, that'll be flagged up to them potentially by a third party. It'll say, look, Zeki, you're literally spending hundreds of pounds at Starbucks a year, but you're not putting anything in your pension. You're not, like, coffee's going to be the least of your worries in 50 years' time. Yeah. So that type of thing, that type of transparency needs to be, needs to be thought about. And so that leads into the, the long term of what this ecosystem will actually look like. So at the moment, we have what's called banking as a service. When we deal with a bank, they're providing us with a service, i.e. if we go into a branch, they're providing us with a service. They're telling us information. They're giving us different insights into things and allowing us to, to get on, basically. What this will transition to potentially in the future is banking as a platform. So what we'll see potentially is that we no longer get a service provided to us by the bank, but we'll move to banking as a platform. So instead of us dealing directly with the bank and the bank giving us this service, this value add, it'll move to these third party providers. So these third party providers will be providing us with the service. I'll pay someone to give me insight about my coffee habit. I will not be going to the bank to get that insight. Instead, we will only be using the banking as a platform, i.e. we'll be only utilizing them for their back-end infrastructure, for how they deal with our payments, for everything that goes on behind the scenes, rather than actually going to them on a day-to-day -day basis and interacting with them. So banks no longer serve us in a traditional way. We probably won't be using a bank or an app's website or directly deal with them at all. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room as well whose banking apps and banking websites which they use are just abysmal. Like there are some good ones, like. Ulster Bank lets you withdraw money without needing a card, that kind of thing. Monzo, these digital banks which are popping up, they are making things better, but it means we have to go to them to get that benefit. What open banking will mean is that these apps which don't provide this value add will fall by the wayside and the ones which actually do provide value to everyone will, will be picked up and used. Yeah. So what I'm gonna actually show you in my little demo here and um, dusted off some code for you, uh, literally, is an app which communicates with one of these open banking APIs. So 
the API it that I'm going to show you is called the Open Bank Project. It's one created by a bunch of developers in Germany. It's utilized by like 99% of the banks in Germany. This was the API which a lot of UK banks, if not all of the UK banks, were using to base their research off. So Santander, Danske Bank, Ulster Bank, RBS, they were all having these hackathons on and inviting people down to win prizes to try and come up with how can we use this API and potentially if we don't use it, how can we improve upon it and actually do something good? Um, the idea really with this API is the Open Bank Project, the company behind it, the way they make money is they say to the banks, um, we can implement this for you, we can put it in front of your architecture and people can communicate with you through this API, which means that you might be able to generate money through different mediums like that. So what I'll do is I'll switch on to this demo here for you. Hopefully this will go okay. Right. So what I've actually got here is I've got a React app communicating with some Java services um, to provide some information. So the React app reaches out to, there's three different Java microservices. I've got an authentication service which communicates with this open banking project API to get authorized to allow my app to actually start doing things. Got a user service, which is what I've implemented to provide some meaningful information to a user. So for example, what I use to analyze transactions. And then what I've got is an account service, which is what I use to actually pull back all of the transactions and pull back all of the accounts of a user. And this does some smart information with it, passes it to my React app, and hopefully you'll think it does some funky stuff. So my video hasn't loaded here. There was supposed to be a video of coins dropping on the screen, but it's hosted online and the internet connection isn't good enough, unfortunately. So what I've actually got running here is to explain, I've actually got an instance of this Open Bank, a open bank Project API run behind the scenes. So what this allows you to do is like you just pull down this code from GitHub, compile it, run it. And what it allows you to do is start experimenting and seeing, okay, what can I actually do? What can I come up with? And it is easy, it's all built in Scala, but you don't really need to worry about the implementation of it. So if I log, at, log on as John Smith, so what this has actually done behind the scenes is it's called off to my Java microservices, said communicate with this open banking project API, pull me back all of the accounts with which I've authorized you to do so. So we've skipped the OAuth workflow here, but the very first time a user would have logged in, they would have been able to add their accounts and accept permissions for different things to pull back transactions. So instead, if you imagine, instead of having three different apps, one for Ulster Bank, one for Santander, one for Lloyds Bank, what you'd have is just one app of this third party provider installed on your phone to do everything for you. And so if he views his Ulster Bank account, he can see all his transactions for that. And something which I was like doing, I was like, none of my banking apps actually have a search facility for my transactions. A search facility, something to literally go through and search for something. It's ludicrous how these banks have actually gone away with such a poor user experience for so long. So I don't play golf, but John Smith does. And he's got his monthly golf membership going along. And what then also what I've got here to add into the mix is this ability for John to then come along and add in his his regular incomes and his regular expenditures, which he knows are going to come out and come into his account every month. What you could potentially extend this to is to make something which automatically picks it up. Use some buzzword AI to do some analysis of your transactions and come up with this stuff. So he can add in this. So he earns £478 from work, gets it on the 30th of each month, and he has a phone bill for £35 on the 15th of each month. So we go back to his account. What this app can do then behind the scenes is use this information, including the financial transactions and these regular incomes and expenditures, to provide some information to John. So his monthly expenditures, reg these are regular, add up to £35, so that's his phone bill. His income is add up to £478, which means his real disposable income is 443 we can tell when his next income is going to be. So his next income will come in the 30th of June. His next expenditure of 35 is going to leave his account before that. So all of the transactions here, unfortunately, are old. And so 
they're actually coming from 2017 when the last time I ran this code. But if these transactions were up to date, what it would do is it just loops through, tells them how much he spends and what on average. And then really the kind of the real value add is do we think you're going to have enough money or not? And there's just like a wee bit of an equation to figure out his average spend, how many days are left before his next income and stuff like that. But really I did this in the guts of the guts of a week and a half at the time. It's really not difficult if you've worked what you can do to begin with before you even need a client. Just open up Postman, start communicating with this open banking project API and just start getting this data back and to see what you can work with. Like I've got the API Explorer up here which lets you see every single endpoint which exists. And Danske Banks and Ulster Banks and Santander, all of their equivalents, some of them are still locked down. They are in the process of letting people sign up for beta access, but they have similar explorers where you can see everything. So for example, you can create accounts. This is account public, actually. This is a really interesting concept which has been brought up by open banking. So this idea of transparency in banking. We have entities which exist in the world which are only there out of public interest. So for example, government organizations, the only reason they exist is to benefit us. Charities, the only reason they exist is so that they can benefit the human race. There have been instances in the past where charity executives have been secretly donating money to terrorist organizations recently in the news, and really, really, like m millions of pounds worth. And the reason that that was able to happen was because there's no transparency over the financial activity which these charities do behind the scenes. Yes, they tell us we spend X amount of money on this, but we don't actually see transaction by transaction. So what this public account actually means is that through open banking, what we can do is we can facilitate a public view of a bank account. So a charity can say, I grant permission for, ever, for an unauthenticated user to see these transactions. And what that means that we could do is if we're regularly donating to a charity, we would we should have the right to go and see how that money is actually being spent. And so what we can do is we can go on and see all of the transactions which are coming along. You've got your standard ones like searching for ATMs. So like there's a lot of stuff. Adding products. So again, this is another big one where there is the potential to add value to users. So all of the banks, Santander, Ulster Bank, etc. They're obliged to put all of their own information as well online. And by their own information, I mean their loans, their mortgages, their credit cards, their savings accounts. And what the option is there for a third party provider, come along, aggregate all of that information really easily. So I know there is credit card comparison sites like Money Supermarket and things like that. But this does introduce something which is built into banking as opposed to an add on service. And what this means that rather than just having a money supermarket, for example, you would just, the playing field would be opened. So for example, you could have an app which comes along, looks at the interest rate of your current, or your current savings account, says, well, your current savings account's getting you 1% APR. I found you a savings account at Santander, which has an APR of 2%. We think you should switch and get benefit from that. Same with credit cards. We found a lower interest credit card. Counterparties and counterparty metadata. So do many people here bank with Monzo? Yeah, quite a few people. So Monzo is really cool. Yeah, we spend money, it tells us. You spent it in the SPAR. Here's a picture of the SPAR. Monzo had to do all that work to get that going. What open banking means is that it's built into banking. Rather than just having Monzo doing that, what it means is that anyone could come along and use that information so someone could come along who makes an app which communicates with Halifax, all your standard banks, the high street banks, and present that counterparty information as well, saying, well, Zach, you used your Halifax card at the SPAR and show a picture of the SPAR. So rather than these companies like Monzo adding value in that way, they'll need to come up with something else, something better to draw customers to it because now it won't be anything special. It'll be built in as standard into banking. So another one I wanted to talk about, so KYC checks. Anyone who works in the financial industry, know your customer, or anyone who has opened a bank account has went through a know your customer check, KYC. This came about after the 9-11 attacks where terrorists were able to open up bank accounts with false identities and things like that. So KYC was introduced around the globe to verify 
people's identities before they open up a bank account. If you try to open a bank account, they're probably going to ask for proof of address, um, proof of identification. Many banks at the moment recently opened up a bank with Halifax. Um, they want you to take your ID in branch. There's not really any way to do that online. Um, Monzo allow you to do it online, so they allow you to take a picture of your passport, take a picture of yourself and record yourself saying a few things. So Monzo are disrupting, yes, they're doing something cool. They're allowing someone, they're allowing the experience to be better. But what this means is all of the things in open bank will mean that, again, that's no longer going to be like a disrupting feature. That'll be built into every single bank and that'll be built into every single, it'll be in the, any single app can do that. And so again, it's this idea that the user is getting a lot more for their money and there's a lot more transparency over what's going on. Um, yeah, like the API is ever expanding. As I say, this is the one which is used in Germany. There, you can go on, to, like Danske Bank especially, I think Danske Bank is probably the one which is leading the way in terms of their open banking API. But you can go on, sign up, use it, and start seeing what, what information you can get from it. And yeah, it gets me pretty buzzed. It gets me pretty passionate. And I do think it will change how we all do banking in the future. And yeah, I hope it excited you too. <laughs> but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. Yeah. Uh, so is this uh, is being adopted in Germany? Is yeah. it standard that you use? Are there other competing standards that other people are doing? Or are they actually converging to Because that's probably the biggest yeah. problem with this, I guess. So, yeah. So across, I don't really know for sure across Europe. I know for a fact there are people saying, so this open bank project says we can implement this API in front of your banking architecture. I'm sure there are other companies offering that as well around Europe. In the UK, it's a bit different. So that open banking working group that I talked about, they have said your API has to look like this. Your API, it has to be. And so any app developer in the UK, that one set of standards is exactly across the board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. very difficult and hard to deal with, and there's so many security concerns with this. Do you think it is treated in the UK more like a chore, or do you think it will be embraced with open arms? Because I think we're moving from the shift of banks being banks. I think, as you say, we're changing the way we work, and I think if, if, if banks are just there to provide a backing legacy system, it's just not caught in it. Yeah. So what do you think banks should do in order to embrace this? Because I don't see this currently. And then as a customer of multiple banks, I don't see this. Yeah. And I only know about it because I work in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's how do you embrace this? How, how, do you, how do you use it so that you're no longer just a bank? It's a big question. Um, what I'll start off with is like a bit of background. So last summer I did a bit of work in over in the States and their banking is, I think it was estimated as being between 30 and 40 years behind the UK. So still using checks, no chip and, well chip and pins starting to come in, but ridiculous adoption rate where many shops, they're still just swiping and signing. And so whenever I was there, I did some research and the banks over there, they were very against open banking. They were very against it and for many reasons because it, it's a lot of work for them as you say there's these legacy systems with code which people wrote many years ago when no one really wants to touch it and break things in the UK at least I actually have been pleasantly surprised by the way the banks are doing it they are legally obliged to be doing it yes <laughs> like switch does mean that they are going to be doing it but for example I mean I keep saying Danske Bank I don't work for Danske Bank I swear <laughs> um, Danske Bank especially, like they had a, an open banking challenge recently run through uh, Techstart NI where they were offering £10,000 to a startup company to come up with an idea of how Danske Bank could provide more value to their customers through the use of open banking. And I did enter and I was unfortunately unsuccessful. <laughs> but it's that type of thing. I think it's getting into the community and encouraging it from a grassroots level 
where what I'm trying to get across is that this is open, this is for everyone, this is for every single person on the ground. You don't need to be a developer, you just need to have an idea of what can I come along, how can I make people's lives better? And I think if the bikes, the banks, sorry, get in on that kind of grassroots level, as I say, down low, speaking to people and getting involved in the community, I think that's how, how it'll succeed. I think they need to increase awareness and increase the adoption of what people actually are going to do with it. But yeah.